Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Marat, for the invitation. Uh, and I really, I try to get to the seminar series as often as I can. It's a, it's a great seminar series, and, and I, it's, uh, you're doing us a service by having these seminars, and we really appreciate it. Um, the uh, the title of the talk is, uh, uh, somebody in the audience was saying, is this, is this theoretical or experimental? No, it's observational, uh, so which I distinguish from, from experiment or, or theory. So it's, it's really uh, very observational. Characterization of clouds at scales down to, uh, to a meter uh, by high resolution photography from the surface and uh, I initiated this project, but I've been joined on it by uh, Dong Huang, uh, who's done the radius of transfer calculations and participated a lot in the, in the project, and uh, Viviana Vladichescu, who's at uh, City University, and she spent a, a summer with some students uh, working on this project and then uh, has continued to be involved in it. Um, so, and this is a cloud photograph, and we'll show you some more. This is what we get out of the activity. This is a map of cloud optical depth. Optical depth is the vertical integral of the extinction coefficient. Uh, so we're working with thin clouds. Uh, and we'll talk more about what we mean by thin. Uh, and this is from uh, our camera. And uh, I, I really should show you what the camera <coughs> looks like. But, but uh, let me, uh, I'll do that in a minute. This is, this is, is the title of a talk that I've been giving for a while, um, cloud fraction, can it be defined, can it be measured, and if we knew it, would it be of any use to us anyway, for which the short abstract is no, no, and no. Um, but my, my climate modeling friends uh, tell me, Steve, uh, cloud fraction is hardwired in the, in the climate models, and it's not going to go away. To which I reply, uh, science advances one funeral at a time. Um, so so uh, we'll get into this cloud fraction. You have to define a cloud. What is a cloud? So the AMS Glossary of Meteorology, a visible, key word, visible, uh, aggregate of minute water droplets and or ice particles in the atmosphere above the surface to distinguish it from a fog. And then total cloud cover, also in the AMS glossary, the fraction of the sky hidden by all visible clouds. So you, um, you're looking up, and is there a cloud there or not? Ramanathan, graduate of this department, uh, cloud cover is a loosely defined term. 
uh, this book by Eugene uh, Clothio, uh, article and book by Eugene Clothio, uh, Barker, and Karlev, surprisingly, and in spite of the fact that we deal with clouds on a daily basis, to date there is no universal definition of a cloud. Ultimately, the definition of cloud depends on the threshold sensitivity of the instrument used, which I would agree with. And then here's this quotation from uh, Potter Stewart, who is the, uh, a justice of the US Supreme Court. He says, I shall not today attempt to further define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, the reference of, uh, uh, in that instance was, was not to clouds, but to pornography. But the same definition holds. Um, I know it when I see it. So, so, uh, but we're trying. What we're trying to do, and that kind of inspired us, is is, is to see if we can characterize these clouds. Um, a lot of people have been doing that for a long time. This is uh, the the Atlas, uh, Steve Warren, and others. Um, at NCAR, and they put together these two huge volumes, which are actually hard to come by these days. You can get them on the web, um, of uh, many, many observations. Uh, in total, something like 160 million observations that they compiled of what's called fractional cloud cover. So an observer goes outside, looks at the sky. What fraction of the sky measured in octaves, or eighths of the sky, goes inside and writes it in a book? And then what, what these guys did was, was then compile all those records and come up with, over land, the cloud cover percentage is 52%. Over ocean, 64. Globally, 61.2. Uh, Three significant figures out of those measurements of one part in eight. Um, and uh, so that's uh, kind of where it stood up, in, up, up, up until the satellite era. Uh, now there are many satellite uh, uh, flying and many satellite products. And, and one of my colleagues, Wei Wu uh, at Brookhaven and, and others, put together a comparison of these of cloud fraction at the ARM site in Oklahoma um, uh, using 10 years worth of data. And they looked at cloud fraction as a function of time of day, a month of year, of year uh, over that period of time from either surface measurements or, or satellite products. And you see, well, uh, there's, there's some coherence in these things, for example, month of year. But the numbers are differing by, by uh, something like 20%, uh, 0.2 out of 1, um, which is huge in, if you're trying then to use these data in some way to evaluate the performance of some model, be it uh, local or, or, or global. And uh, it, is, it really depends on how these instruments that are on these particular platforms are, are, are defining what's a cloud. So we're back to, in some sense, definition. Um, this is, these are uh, comparing a bunch of satellites and the Warren atlases that are over here. Uh, again, uh, cloud fraction. Uh, here's a scale from, from uh, 0.5 up to 0.8, and you can see more or less, I plotted it at that. Well, it's from the paper by, by Stubenreich. But um, I have really adapted it uh, quite a bit from that paper. But what you're seeing is a, a kind of an increase over time of the global uh, mean cloud fraction. And why are we seeing an increase, a, a huge increase um, over time? It has nothing to do with geophysics. It has to do with the ability of, of improved instruments to see clouds that the previous instruments didn't see. And that's why the cloud fraction is increasing with time. So it is, it's not geophysics. Um, here's model world. Um, so here's cloud fraction in a bunch of, of climate models, uh, global annual mean. And then here's one of those satellite products. Um, and what should, should strike you when you're looking at these things, is, is most of these models have too few clouds, at least according to uh, this particular instrument, um, which is known in the trade. Uh, well, nonetheless, um, the, the models are all getting Earth's energy budget quite well, doing a very good job at getting the energy budget quite well. Well, what's happening? It, it, it's it's the, what's called the, the the too few, too bright problem. 
too few clouds in the model, but the clouds that are there are, are have to, you have to get the albedo right. You have to get the planetary uh, albedo right. So the pl clouds that are there then are compensating that by, by being too bright. So that's a, 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 a measure of, of, of these issues. Here's a nice paper. It's an albedo, which is probably a good unit. Uh, it's at Bender at Al Tellus of 2006, and what she did is compared uh, 20 GCMs with the Irby satellite data, uh, doing a subtraction. The subtraction amplifies the difference. And so what you're seeing here is on a scale of, of albedo of, of minus 0.1 to plus 0.1 it, as a function of year, because they're real measurements. Um, and as a function of latitude on the vertical axis. And, and what you see is that some models are, are very, um, let's see, I've got to get the sign right, a model greater than observation is the blue. So some models are very bright, some models are, are excessively dark, it's, it's a function of season, it's a function of latitude. But all the models are getting the planetary albedo right. So um, clouds are, of course, the big issue, and that's kind of what motivated uh, 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 this, this activity. Um, climate sensitivity is very sensitive to the representation of clouds in models, and this is from a paper by Briant and all in Journal of Climate this year. And what they did was they compared uh, a bunch of, of climate models, plotted them the, the change in cloud albedo of low clouds with temperature in, in their models to try to look at them that way. And so what's here is two examples of that uh, where, where we're looking at that uh, derivative here in the blue uh, uh, or in the color scale. And the color scale is showing here that, that these models have a high change in low cloud fraction. Okay, so low cloud fraction is, is, is positive in these models that are showing up here in the blue. And low, the change in low cloud fraction with temperature, it's a change with temperature. The change with temperature is negative, low clouds evaporating, or disappearing, low clouds, more of them uh, as you're in, sign change, uh, as you're increasing uh, temperature. And that that's what's uh, strongly correlated with, with the model sensitivities. Um, so now that brings us back to the topic of, of today's talk, which is characterization of clouds at, at um, uh, these submeter scales. And I presented this material really in public for the first time at the Joram Kaufman Symposium uh, back in June. Uh, at NASA, Joram Kaufman, some of you may remember him, was a, a, a very prominent and creative aerosol scientist, aerosol and cloud scientist at NASA, um, and very much involved in the uh, development of, of products associated with, with the MODIS uh, satellite. And so this is uh, really, in some sense, a, a tribute uh, to Joram Kaufman and his contributions. This is. Um, uh, what we will refer to as an RGB, red, green, blue image, like you would get with your digital camera. But you're in space, and you're looking down. And here's a scale bar of 200 kilometers. And one pixel in that product is, is 250 meters. And that's a picture. But, but um, what they got out of that is a product called cloud optical depth. Cloud optical depth, the, the vertical integral of the extinction coefficient as a function of location at the particular time they're taking this image. Um, and ability as well to distinguish ice clouds and water clouds, but I want to call to your attention the water clouds that are in this uh, uh, warm color scale, uh, going from something like 1 up to 75. Uh, 75 is a very optically thick cloud. Photons. Uh, hit the top and, and they don't percolate through to the bottom very much, and that's why it gets dark on a, on a, when you have a thick cloud over your head. They come back out the top, and of course that's very important uh, radiatively. The, um, and and th what I commented at, at the time when I gave this uh, uh, is, uh, what an audacious concept. Uh, what a bold concept to put an imager in space and then 
try to get from the radiance that that imager is, is measuring a, a geophysical product, the, the, the uh, cloud optical depth. Um, and and it, it was really imaginative, bold uh, uh, kind of a concept. And I see I'm actually wearing the same shirt as I wore <laughs> uh, uh, when I gave that talk. Uh, the uh, Ilan Korins, again, some of you may know, who's been very uh, much involved in characterization of clouds. And this was a, sort of his view of clouds. This is from the MODIS airborne simulator, which is flown on an aircraft, so it gets better resolution. One pixel of 50 meters. And you can see what I want to call your attention to both, well, in this one, uh, uh, all the spatial variability. And then in this one, again, a lot of spatial variability in, in those kinds of images. Here's an artist's view of clouds. Uh, here's another artist's view of clouds. This is Murat's uh, simulation. So, so I, I consider Murat an artist. He do, does com computer art and, and, and puts it on his <laughs> web page. Um, and, uh, but now we're getting down to the point where where one grid cell in this is 100 meters. Uh, and and um, uh, this is a, uh, simulating a particular field project uh, uh, using the conditions from that project. And then I uh, presume evaluating the, the skill. And here's a 10 kilometer scale bar. Um, this is a, uh, a climate model, uh, climate modeler's view of clouds. They're, they're rectangular parallel of pipe heads. They fill a grid cell of 100 kilometers or so. Uh, they may not completely fill it. You have partial cloudiness. But uh, nonetheless, they're rectangular parallel pipe heads. They may be stacked vertically above each other. They may be staggered. Uh, and, and then they've got the next grid cell over. Um, discover, or EPIC, um, or if you wish, the Al Gore satellite. Um, remember the story. Uh, Al Gore wanted to put a satellite at the uh, L1 point, the Lagrange point between the sun and the Earth, where there's a reasonably stable uh, place you can, you can put a, a satellite, um, and take pictures of Earth. Why? Uh, for science, in part, but, but also for inspiration. This is our blue marble. This is what we, where we live. And it's, um, uh, it was all ready to go uh, in the uh, uh, year 2000. And, and then uh, the Bush administration came in. They didn't want that, so they put it in mothballs. But they kept it uh, in, in, in reasonably good shape. Then the Obama administration came in. Oh, we've got this satellite. Let's put it up. So it was launched. It's been put into orbit. It's generating. It's, it's looking always at the sunlit side of the Earth. Um, uh, so and the Earth's rotating underneath it. And it takes a photograph, and it gets an image. Um, and they, they've got colors. They superimpose the colors and gives an image about every hour. So you're getting something like 24 uh, images of the planet a day. It's on the web page within a day or so after they take the, the picture. And, and, and you can see um, uh, 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 weather systems moving around and, 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 and doing their thing. And it's an RGB image. It's four megapixels. Well, think of your cameras these days. Four megapixels is kind of a small camera. Uh, but that's what they had back in, in, in the late 90s to put out into space. And uh, one pixel is 5.2 uh, micro radians. So if you're, the, the distance of, of this thing to the Earth is, is as I recall, 1.5 uh, million kilometers. Uh, so you, you work that through. And, so, and five microradians is eight kilometers um, uh, for uh, the resolution of a single pixel in, in that image. And here's a scale bar of 1,000 kilometers. And now here's our view of a cloud that we take with our digital camera. So we have a digital camera. Uh, we're on the surface. We're looking up. I brought the camera in to show you our instrument. Uh, this is, a, this is a $400 camera. Um, turn it on. It's got a zoom lens. You should be able to see uh, the zoom lens. So you, there's the zoom lens. Uh, and you zoom it all the way out. And 
For those of you who are old enough to remember 35 millimeter film cameras, um, this has an effective focal length of uh, 1,200 millimeters. We'll get to that in a moment. What's 1,200 millimeters? Well, we'll get to that. Um, but it, what it means is that the resolution with the, with the 12 megapixels, it's, it's actually 16, we square it up, uh, 12 megapixels, 16-bit depth, that, uh, that's this, uh, sort of the intensity resolution in each of three channels, R, G, and B, red, red, green, and blue. But the resolution, one pixel is six microradians. So if your cloud is at a six microradians, your cloud is at a kilometer, that's six millimeters resolution, two kilometers, that, that's 12 millimeters resolution. So one pixel here is uh, something like uh, uh, 12 millimeters for, the, for this particular cloud. Um, and as I say, we get an optical depth product, uh, which, which we'll get into how we get that. This is from the blue channel of the camera. Uh, uh, the, I want to give you some context. Let me let's look at these numbers for a moment. Optical depth of 0.5, 1, 1.52, 2.5. So it's a thin cloud. Optical depth of, of 0.5, the likelihood of a photon encountering that cloud being scattered is 50%. That's, that's an optical depth of 0.5. It's got a half a chance of being scattered and, and, and the other half a chance of not being scattered and getting through. Um, you, can't, you, have to, you, you know how to propagate probabilities. You can't just say this is a chance of two, but the, the mean number of scattering events will be two if there's an optical depth of two. Um, the point that I would like to make in the context of these thin clouds is that they are radiatively very important. Um, the, so the liquid water path, you, uh, you, uh, how much, uh, it's the vertical integral of the amount of liquid water that you have in terms of uh, grams per square meter is one way to do that, is, is, is a product of effective radius times the optical depth, uh, a factor of two thirds for geometry. Uh, if the optical depth is one, effective radius is six micrometers, the liquid water path is four micrometers, or four grams per square meter. And I want to compare that with typical precipitable water in the atmosphere. Precipitable water might be something like two centimeters, depends on, on your latitude and season. So, so our, 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 our two times ten to the fourth grams per square meter versus four. Um, a, a, a paper in BAMS that was dealing with, with optically thin clouds uh, saying that the, the sort of the threshold for an optically thin cloud is 100 grams per square meter or 100 micrometers. We're talking about four micrometers. If the drop is uh, six micrometers in diameter, that means sort of one drop in, an, in, a, in a vertical column uh, that the photon is encountering with. Um, these are hard to impossible to measure by radar or by microwave. They're, they're thin clouds. Um, but the point that I would try to leave you with is that these thin clouds are extremely important from a radiative perspective. Um, this is a, a trying to demonstrate that as a kind of a busy uh, a view graph. And it's, what it's trying to show is as a function of cloud shortwave optical depth in the visible, um, the, the radiative influence of such a cloud. And uh, uh, pay attention initially to the, the blue line or curve that's on these. That's the shortwave. It's negative. Sunlight is cutting, coming down. Cloud is reflecting sunlight up outside uh, to the top of the atmosphere and is leaving. So it's, it's, it's the cloud. Clouds in general uh, are exerting a, a negative influence on Earth's radiation budget. The more clouds you have, the less sun you absorb. And that's the sign convention. Um, Ramanathan, I mentioned earlier, uh, a very important paper coming out of Irby. And that's really uh, uh, more or less the time he was here, or, or, or shortly thereafter, working with Bob Sess, uh, prominent in that activity. And uh, Bob Sess's uh, uh, memorable uh, uh, observation at that point was, uh, hey, 
from Irby, we can get two planets for the price of one. We'll, we'll screen against clouds and we'll measure the radiation budget with, with uh, 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 the, cloud, uh, the whole planet and then we'll screen it against clouds and we'll measure it without the clouds and we'll take the difference and we'll get the cloud radiative effect. Now the short wave cloud radiative effect globally is something like 48 watts per square meter, long wave something like 30 and then the net is, is the difference. So that's kind of what's being plotted here. Uh, except that it's, we're, we're localizing it, we're doing the calculation at a mid-latitude site with the arm site in Oklahoma. As a function of shortwave optical depth, looking at the blue for the moment, we're starting with zero, no cloud. Uh, we got a thin cloud in, it's coming in, it's coming in, it's getting thicker and thicker, up to an optical depth of 100 or so. And the radiative influence of that cloud is something like 200 watts per square meter. And you say, well, what's that 200 watts per square meter mean? Uh, what it means is it's a 24-hour average, to be honest, and this, uh, the calculation is done at the equinox to give you a, a, a good sense of what that is. So it can be compared with other radiative quantities. Um, the, the, uh, to, to put things in perspective, um, the global mean um, uh, top of the atmosphere irradiance that's coming down on the planet from the sun is something like 340 watts per square meter. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, solar constant is four times that at, at 1360. Divide by four because of the area of the Earth. Your average is, is something like 340. So, so, so an, an average of 200 is huge in, in, in that context. Um, what these graphs are the same thing, but it's on a linear scale just to show you the functional behavior of, of this quantity uh, uh, on four different decades. So here's 0 to 0.1 on an optical depth. And what we get is a shortwave radiative uh, effect of clouds of something like 5 watts per square meter. So, so even an optical depth of 0.1 uh, is 5 watts per square meter. Optical depth of one is something like uh, 40 watts per square meter. It's not quite linear, and it, it, it goes out. And so that's the thrust of that. And then what's shown in the red is, is the long wave uh, for uh, different temperatures of the cloud, because the cloud is radiating the, in the long wave at different temperatures. And then the green is the net. But the point in here, especially on the short wave, is, is that even very thin clouds can have an enormous radiative influence. Another context. Um, a doubling of CO2, if we were to step function double CO2 in the atmosphere, is something like 4 watts per square meter. Here's this cloud of an optical depth of 0.1, and it's giving us 5 watts per square meter. So they, they, again, the measure of importance. Here's back to that, that graph that I was showing you in the blue channel. Here's the red channel. So we get independent measurements of optical depth from two different channels of the camera. I'm going back and forth. Yeah, you can see there's slight differences, but th there's a lot of coherence between the two of those. And that's what's plotted here is the coherence. And you can see there's scatter. And the scatter is likely due to noise in the camera. Um, but you're, the theory says that you ought to be on the one-to-one -one line, which is in the green. And the observations are showing that it's within something like 15% of that. So we're, we're, uh, uh, at least for consistency, uh, we're doing rather well between those independent measurements. Um, and here's the camera that I just showed you. Uh, it's Fujifilm FinePix S1. Uh, except no substitutes. Um, 16 megapixels, three colors, 16 bits, 1200 millimeter focal length, 35 millimeter equivalent, uh, qualify that. One pixel is six micro radians when you're fully zoom extended. Field of view is uh, 22 by 29 milli radians, or, or two by three sun diameters. There's another way to look at our moon diameters. They're about the same. And when we bought them, they were 350. They're getting scarce. Uh, 1,200 millimeters focal length is real important for this project. This is a 1,200 millimeter lens. Uh, this is uh, uh, 12, that's 1.2 meters uh, on, a, on a 35 millimeter camera. And, and uh, it, one, they made them in the 90s mostly for military purposes. They're hard to come by. Um, one recently appeared in the used photographic uh, equipment market for $180,000. Here's a moonshot. If you have a, 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 a zoom camera and you, you say you think it's any good, the first thing you do is you go out on a full moon and you take a picture of the moon. So here's our field of view. And it's, it's two by three moon diameters or sun diameters. And, and here's a close-up. 
So you can go outside and put the camera on the tripod and snap a picture like this with, with this camera. So we're, 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 uh, it's a nice little camera. It's astonishing that you can buy this sort of thing for $400. Um, resolving power. So here's a student uh, standing by the stop sign at a kilometer and, and the camera set on a tripod and take a picture. And you can zoom in, you can see it says stop sign. You can pretty much make out it says four way. And here he's holding the target, and this is the, what the target is. And so these are four centimeter blocks on the target. Here's zooming in on that, and you can see the four centimeter blocks nicely uh, resolved at a kilometer. And then here's a line trace ac across those shown in false color. Uh, and so the false color is bringing out those uh, four centimeter blocks very nicely, and you can see the line trace across that. And that's one pixel width of line trace across that. Um, color, uh, RGB. Um, here's the blue channel response, here's the red channel response. A little bit of blue sneaks through into the red channel, doesn't bother as much, and the green kind of overlaps the two of those, and we're focusing on the red and the blue, which are really quite separated. You look at a cloud in the sky, and what's the first thing you see? A cloud looks white, the sky looks blue. I mean, that's, so that's, so what's white? White contains a, a lot of, of red in it, blue contains blue in it. Uh, so, so the white contains both the red and the blue. So, but, so color is a real important distinction uh, if you're trying to identify clouds. And um, we, we make use of that. Um, a lot of the NASA instruments, they, they, they're putting various spectrometers, and they call them hyperspectral. Our little joke is, is that we're, we're hypospectral. We're, we, but we think we've got enough information, really, in these two channels. And just, uh, again, to a little advertisement for the camera, I think this is a terrific camera. Does anybody here know what, what um, bird that is? Who? Eagle. Eagle, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a bald eagle. But, but he's not bald yet, because he, he's, he's a freshman. Um, this is his first year, uh, and uh, they don't turn bald until something like four or five years. And, and um, I live on the Forge River, which you can see on the map of Long Island, the South Shore, and go canoeing and take my camera with me and take photographs, and, and I, as I say, I love this, this camera, and, and this is the kind of thing you can, you can get with that. And we've got bald eagles nesting on the Forge River the first time since the 1930s, so something is good. I know people here have done a lot of water chemistry on the Forge River, and, and it's considered a, an impaired waterway, and uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether anything gets done about that. Okay, here's a moonshot with some clouds in front of it, just to show you um, the variability of clouds on, on the kind of scale that, that we're talking about. Steve, um, so we took, yeah. Can you for a second? Sure. Was that handheld? This is, that's handheld from a canoe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I may, I'm, I probably ha uh, had beached the canoe at that point to take this photograph, but it, it is handheld. It's got remarkable image stabilization in it uh, as well. What does uh, the do what's that? What does the shutter do? The, sh the, sh the, the shutter? Yeah, the time between the ocean and the bottom. Oh, the shutter lag. Yeah. Um, it's very slight. Uh, uh, that won't bother you. Uh, you, you, get, you get your picture. If, um, a problem is if it's hunting for focus. So if you got to get it, you got to get it in focus. You hold the button halfway down until it's uh, you've got a good focus, and then you push the button, and it's basically you're not going to notice the lag. Um, so we went out to the arm site, in, uh, Southern Great Plains site in Oklahoma. But why? Basically, because we there are a lot of other instruments there that can inform our measurements. Uh, uh, we can get clouds anywhere, uh, but we located ourselves right next to a Doppler lidar. Uh, here's our two cameras. Uh, we located ourselves next to a Doppler LiDAR, and the Doppler LiDAR uh, gives you a, a return for aerosol, but even more important for this project, gives us the, the, the cloud base height real well. Uh, so we, we, we needed to know that. Um, here's the geometry of the kind of thing we were doing. This is one particular day. Um, you're, you're not used to east being on the left of your map, but if you, you think you're looking up and you're, and you're, you're looking up and, and to, your, to the, uh, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> uh, you're, looking, you're looking to the south, yeah. north is behind you, east is to your left. Uh, so the sun is coming up in the east and, and this is UTC and it's going across the sky like this. And then here in, we have two cameras out there. 
Uh, one's our wide field of view camera, one's our narrow field of view where the zoom is fully extended. So the, the wide field of view camera is, is this one that's shown in, in um, cyan. Uh, maybe make, make it out here, it is on the same scale. And then their narrow field of view camera is represented by this, which is at the center. So it's a, it's a very narrow field of view. It's a third of the sun diameter. The sun is drawn to 10 times its, its actual uh, angular dimension, so you can see it on, on, on the, on the uh, chart. Uh, so, so we're looking straight up. Um, the sun rises, goes around us. We, we're never looking at the sun. We, we shield the, the camera lens from the direct sunlight because we don't want sunlight rattling around in, in the camera. Um, and we, we tell the camera, take a picture every four seconds. Um, so uh, we tell it to take the picture faster, except that we're limited by the write speed of, of the data onto the chip, uh, onto the, the, the removable um, card that's in the camera. Um, and so it takes pictures. So here is a minute. Um, here's the next minute. Here's the next minute. You're looking straight up. The clouds are, are kind of wafting by you. Uh, uh, and, and so we get instances where we get pretty much filling the field of view with cloud, and then instances where, the, where basically the cloud is gone. And that's important to us. And then we're tr going to try to characterize these things. And if you look at features, as, as, as you go across here, you can identify features. And you can see them coming in as, as, as the wind is blowing them to the uh, 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 from west to east, a little bit of north-south motion on that as well. OK, that's our, this is our wide field of view camera. So do I say it on here? Yeah, we're looking at, if, if, um, uh, if the clouds are two kilometers, we're looking at a, a piece of real estate that's something like 240 by 320 meters. Um, we're taking a photograph every four seconds, and then it's uh, 15 in a minute, and that's one minute going across. And then here's our narrow field of view camera. Um, I want to point out this little rectangle here. That's the, the field of view of the narrow field of view camera inside the field of view of the wide field of view camera. So here's the narrow field of view camera, uh, looking at that. And again, you're seeing the, sort of the same thing, but you're seeing a lot of these thin clouds. And I don't, I, I'm hesitant to uh, draw any uh, climatology out of uh, 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 a few days of, of measurements at, at, at one location. But our observations with the camera at several locations, our observations with the eye we go outside, is that the thin clouds like this are, are quite common. We have a paper in review. We got back reviewer comments. Um, it was, uh, the paper was sent to five reviewers. Um, uh, in the aggregate of some 27 pages of reviewer comments, and one of the reviewers says, you don't have to tell the reader that this is not a climatology. Uh, but uh, so, so it's, no, it's not a climatology. I'll tell you anyway. Um, the, the, but but we, we're finding that, the, that these thin clouds are, are in fact, uh, uh, quite prevalent. Um, now, how do we then go from what we get in the camera, which is a picture, a bunch of pictures. Oh, I should point out, we square it up to, uh, to look at the central portion of that. We want to avoid any possibility of vignetting, uh, not getting the same amount of, of light through the lens system. Um, so how do we go from that camera image to um, uh, a, a geophysical quantity, cloud optical depth? So what's shown here, and I should back up. Don't pretend you didn't look at that. Um, I don't know if any of you know Christine Chu. She uh, was at NASA. She's now at Reading. Uh, uh, and she's done a lot of work uh, in characterizing uh, clouds with, with radiometers. And there was an arm meeting in Louisville, Kentucky some years ago. And Southwest, and you know, you pick your seat. And I got an early, a low number, and I got a nice seat by a window. I'm very happy, and there's an empty seat right next to me. Christine comes into the plane. She sees the empty seat. Now. She makes a beeline for that, that empty seat. She says, let me ask you a question. She says, suppose you're looking straight up, and there's no, no cloud in the picture whatsoever. And then a cloud starts coming in the picture. What, what's going to happen? Is it going to get brighter or darker? Well, cloud comes in the picture. It's going to get darker. No, she pounced on me. OK, you're wrong. Um, she was so happy. Um, the, um, 
what happens is, and let's, let's try to walk through that, okay, as a function of cloud optical depth, what we are talking about now that I've plotted on the y-axis is the, what we're calling the normalized zenith radiant. So what do I mean by that? It's um, the irradiance that's coming down on the surface is watts per meter squared per nanometer. Um, when you're looking at a particular angle looking up, you're looking at, a, at, at watts per meter squared uh, per nanometer uh, wavelength uh, per steradian, uh, is a solid angle. So the, the ratio of those two quantities has units of per steradian. So that's this, what we're calling the normalized zenith radiance. The radiance is coming down straight from straight above you per irradiance that's coming in at the top of the atmosphere. Um, that's the quantity that's being plotted. Okay. At very low cloud, no cloud whatsoever, the, this is, is a low number. Why is it a low number? Only thing you have in, in, in the atmosphere above you is, is gas, Rayleigh. You've got Rayleigh scattering. Photons coming through, slight angle because we're not looking at the sun, coming through. Whatever photon you see coming at you straight down is scattered by gas molecules in that column of air. Um, now, start putting in a few cloud droplets. Cloud droplets are, are big scatterers. They're, they're, they're comparable to larger than the wavelength of the light. So they're much more efficient scatter. You don't need much in the way of cloud optical thickness to start affecting that as you start putting in a little bit of cloud. So you put in a little bit of cloud, the scene gets brighter. Now, put in a lot of cloud, and then what's happening is most of the photons are then going to go out of the top as opposed to making their way through to the bottom so it gets darker again. So that's the thrust of this. It's shown in two colors, uh, the, the colors blue and red representing the two wavelengths of our camera. And uh, this particular calculation is done for a particular solar zenith angle, cosine of the zenith angle, uh, 0.85. So that's roughly 30 degrees uh, off of the, um, the, the vertical. So with the higher cloud optical depth and normalized zenith radiance decreases with the increasing cloud optical depth. And then what, what really dawned uh, insight, the light bulb went on, he said, we can invert this. And we can take this curve, rotate it so that you're now plotting cloud optical depth against the normalized zenith radiance. And if you got the, the, the normalized zenith radiance, then you can go up this curve and measure across and get the cloud optical depth, provided you can demonstrate to yourself that you're, not, you're below this maximum where it's going to turn around and, and, and go the other direction. So that was, that was in some sense, the, the, one of the light bulbs that went on. Um, another of the light bulbs went on, well, how are we going to, do, how are we going to calibrate this thing to, to um, uh, normalize the zenith radiance? And the other thing is uh, we, we can do this on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. So that, that, that's, that's the great strength of the imager. So, we, we considered calibration approaches, absolute calibration, radiative transfer calculations. Uh, the, what we ended up going with was the radiative transfer calculations because we say, look, suppose we have a Rayleigh sky. We do the radiative transfer calculation for that. We know what the, the calculation telling us the normalized zenith radiance is. So we got that point. Then we'll, we'll take a bunch of photographs. We'll find the brightest one the f brightest pixels in, the, in those images of a series of, of thinnish clouds, and then that's going to give us the, the, the number that's, uh, that's up here. So we got a two-point calibration, and we can use that to then to retrieve the optical depth onto something like this before it starts, the curve starts getting too vertical. So that was another one of the light bulbs that went on. So we basically calibrate on dark and, and bright scenes, and we get our calibration that way. And then there are some concerns. Well, Aerosol, there's always inevitably aerosol, and that'll be contributing to the, what we call the Rayleigh signal. And it's a dependence on a, 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 the radiative transfer calculation. We do it as a 1D um, disort, for those who know it, um, uh, radiative transfer calculation, which assumes essentially plain parallel independent pixels. Uh, it depends on the assumption, some assumptions we make, like the asymmetry para parameter, which is the uh, the, the amount of, of, of uh, the directional amount of the light in terms of forward scattering. Um, so, so do you, you needed to make an important assumption about the 
spatial distribution of the clouds, right? Yeah, that's 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 one of the issues that, that a, a bunch of the reviewers had with this paper is, is this essentially plain parallel um, assumption that we're making on the radiative transfer. Um, why um, for optically thin clouds we we argue back, hope I hope successfully, uh, that. Um, that, that the single scattering, the, uh, the fact that the, the, your signal is dominated by single scattering or by a very small number of scattering events um, makes you kind of immune to uh, lateral photon transport. There's other issues as well. Suppose you have some cloud that's shading the particular piece of real estate of the cloud that you're looking at, that's going to give you a bad number. Or you've got sidewall reflection off a cloud that's making it brighter. So we, we screen, we try to identify situations where we don't have that. And then the fact that we are, are very close to one scattering event means that, that you really don't have to worry about horizontal transport. And that's, that's the argument we're making, and I think it's a legitimate one. What about the angle of the sun in the sky? I mean, if it's midday, the photons are coming straight down, but if it's late in the afternoon, it looks like Oh, yeah. You, know, you, have, you have to do the... This, this radiative transfer calculation is done for a particular solar zenith angle, and you have to take that into account. Um, and, and these curves will change with solar zenith angle, uh, but oh, uh, negligibly for the period of time of, of, uh, of those seven minutes that we were looking at, but over the course of the day, yes. And, and what, what we're hopeful of but haven't demonstrated is, is that this kind of calibration will stick over the course of the day, and then, then you make the calibration once at a particular zenith angle, and then you, you know it for, for others, and you can continue to use that calibration. But we're not, um, uh, uh, we, have, we haven't really tried it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about spatial, zooming in on things. Uh, so here's uh, an RGB photograph. Um, one of the reviewers didn't like the, using the word photograph for a digital image. Um, but if you go to Wikipedia, uh, the first example they give is, is, is any, any um, representation of, of, of the spatial distribution of light coming off of a scene, uh, and they immediately start going into digital, and they say, oh, by the way, they used to use film. Um, the, uh, the, um, so here's the, here's the RGB image. Um, here's false color. Uh, I don't know that I used the term false color. I should have or, or when I introduced these, these images earlier. But it's cloud optical depth and false color. And then, then we zoom in. And so here's a 5 meter scale bar. Here's a 50 centimeter scale bar. And you can see structure, uh, uh, brightness and, and, and darkness on that scale. And possibly even down to the 10 centimeter scale. But that's getting us into issues of noise in the camera. So I don't want to hang my hat particularly on that. We'll take that out of the paper. Um, let me kind of summarize on the strengths and advantages of this approach. It's high resolution. It, it really is. Um, uh, and so when you demonstrate the ability to do 20 microradians with, with that uh, resolution work with the stop sign, um, we get 12 million independent measurements. And, and one of the reviewers pointed out that's a little bit of hype because um, in any in, in the red and the green, you don't. You, 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 your camera has 12 megapixels, but half of them are green, and, and a quarter of them are red, and a quarter of them are blue. So it's only three million independent in each um, uh, uh, color. Um, high dynamic range, which I've al already mentioned, so so we can resolve a lot of the uh, uh, gradations in brightness, which is nice. Um, I think one of the biggest advantages of this is that. Our camera's pointing straight up. We're looking at the, the black background of outer space. Um, there's no influence of the surface, or at least uh, to first order. If the light hits the surface, bottom of the cloud, and comes back at you, yes, you'll have a surface influence. The Rayleigh radiance is exactly calculable. We know that. So, and I contrast that with a satellite that's looking down and has all the ground clutter, uh, 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 sand, uh, snow, ice, uh, 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 vegetation, uh, that, that's also coming up to the, the detector and the satellite that it has to deal with. So we, we think this is a, a, a real strength. Uh, nowadays, there's readily available data acquisition hardware imaging proce processing software, so we can, we can get this stuff and, and, and deal with it. And there's, there's a lot of uh, software in, in, uh, available for that. Low cost, as I've already mentioned. Uh, lots of data. 
So, so we, we take the images in so-called raw format. So each image is um, something like um, uh, 30 uh, uh, megapixels. Uh, you take 15 of those in a minute. So you're up to uh, a, a gig in a minute. Um, and then go for an hour or four hours before the battery runs down or the card gets filled. So you're up to four gigs and, and something like that. So, so lots of data. We have lots of data in the can. Um, there's lots of sort of more than image processing, but image processing and, and the science that goes with it to be done. And uh, any students who might be interested to get involved in that sort of thing, come and talk to me. I, I, we, we need um, uh, people who are computer savvy, who can run some Linux programs and, and sort of get these things going. Uh, limitations, it's two dimensional only. One of the reviewers says, well, that's not a limitation. No, but, but it's not three dimensional. But, but two dimensional, giving you an image is, is, is just tremendous advance over uh, instruments that are looking up and measuring zenith radiance, but giving you a point measurement and, and not giving you the image. It's daytime only. Uh, again, one of the reviewers said, hey, come on, don't, don't, don't undersell. Um, it's hyper-local. You've only got it, you're, you're only looking at a piece of real estate that's, that's uh, maybe 40 meters on a side or something, depends on cloud height. Hypospectral, uh, but we argue that actually two channels may be enough. Um, think black and white photography for a moment. Any of you old enough to remember that? Um, if you have black and white film in your camera and you want to take a picture and you want to bring out a dramatic cloud, you put a red filter on it. And that makes the blue sky go black. And so the, the, the red light from the white cloud comes through and you get these uh, Ansel Adams type um, uh, very dramatic clouds. So uh, really two colors we think is sufficient to, to characterize the, the cloud and, and, and we, uh, the, the cloud amount and, 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 and something we're calling a radiative cloud fraction, which is not, a, not based on the threshold. Um, and we're limited right now to optically thin clouds, although we, we have some ideas as how we might push this further. Uh, to, to summarize, uh, we would say that, that high resolution digital photography, even the viewer doesn't like the term, from the surface presents an unprecedented view of cloud structure. And the resolution is some three to five orders of magnitude than existing approaches, imaging approaches. Um, the, the, we get the pixel by pixel retrieval of the optical depth for these thin clouds uh, with resolution of, of something like a few centimeters for a, for a cloud at two kilometers. There's a lot of spatial structure, which, which you can see in the, in the images. Uh, which, which we're exploring and trying to look at what uh, ways of characterizing that spatial variability. Uh, and variation on scales down to 10 centimeters, which we attribute to variation in, in cloud optical depth. And so I want to leave you then with, with this kind of a, a false color picture showing you the, the structure, pointing out some of, of uh, the filament of stuff. And we see that a lot. Here's some filaments that are coming down. So that's the kind of thing we're seeing. That's the kind of thing we're characterizing. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. Okay, any questions? My, my question about the, the resolution. I, I have a 12 megapixel smartphone. If I take your photograph now without the flash, it will be kind of blurry. Is that because of the lens, or is it because of the noise in those? Um, so we're just wondering, is, is the lens really up to a pixel by pixel resolution? Have you looked at that? Yeah, when it, uh, we, that's why we did that characterization that I showed you with the student holding the target at, at, at a kilometer. Um, and we're able to get the, the really um, discernibly resolve those four centimeter blocks that we put on our target. Um, the, uh, there's something in photography called a point spread function, which says, well, uh, if light comes from a point, how much does it spread out in terms of your pixel? So I don't know what the point spread function is in, um, uh, in your uh, uh, cell phone camera. But, but, but um, the, the point spread function on this camera is really pretty good. But 
if you had something that was, it was in the intervening atmosphere that was going to uh, spread things out, like some aerosol, that might spread things out, uh, degrade that resolution some. So in, in fact, any spatial variation that we see is, is, is probably an underestimate of, of that variation because of, of issues associated with the point spread function. Um, but um, uh, it, it, you know, that said, it's, uh, it's, it's F5.6 uh, for the photographers here, and um, uh, so you've got a fairly bright image that's, that's impacting on, on each pixel. Uh, so that that's helping you some. There is noise associated with the camera as well. So you can use like uh, four thousand dollar magnifying camera. Um, the question is this: if um, the question is whether if I if I spent more money on on the camera, would would we do better? Possibly. I um, the. Uh, uh, the, one of the ways that this achieves that 1,200 millimeters effective focal length, 35 millimeter equivalent focal length, is that the sensor is quite small. So with a more expensive camera, you'll get a larger CMOS, a, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. That's the sensor in the camera. You'll get a larger sensor, and that will diminish your the noise that's associated with every one of the pixels. So that, that might uh, uh, be a direction for improvement. Um, there's and doing the photography. I you know there, there's there's you you, you don't want to set the thing on autofocus. It'll just hunt around forever trying to find a focus on on that uh, wispy cloud. You have to set the focus uh, at a at a long focal length. We set it basically on a as, as distant object as we can find and and, and focus it up. Um, but you're getting remarkable resolution in, in, uh, on distant objects. Uh, uh, so so. Um, I'm not. It, one of my one of my, my wishes, and I, uh, is it would be a faster write speed for the card, that, for the memory card that's in the camera, because I'd like to take pictures, not just at every four seconds. I'd like to take them at a tenth of a second or something like that. And what's that? Which one? Okay, I, I'll talk to you about cameras. But um, if we can get, if we can get. Um, uh, that kind of temporal resolution, then we can start looking at uh, so, so, uh, sort of the temporal evolution of, of, of brightness, which will, I would say is probably a, a good measure of, of looking at local vertical velocity and turbulent uh, uh, motions in the clouds fr uh, from that way, and then registering them as, as the wind blows, and that's not going to be an issue. But you know, for somebody in the younger generation who knows how to, to program that kind of stuff up with neural nets or whatever. Yeah, Bob? Uh, you thought about <coughs> taking uh, optical depth measurements against the moon for getting nighttime coverage. It's got a lot of problems, but it seems like something is better than nothing. Yeah, moon might be a good, a good way to do that. Um, the the, of course, we can't then compare that to what we're getting from the RT, but it, at least to try to get some optical. Um, the the, uh, the suggestion has come up. Well, gee, can't you use your 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 lidar uh, penetrating through the cloud, getting a return from above the cloud, and then and doing that to get an, uh, an independent measure of the optical depth. Well, there's a lot of differences. Those are one second averages. They are averaging over a lot of space, where the lidar beam spreads out. Uh, well, we could average these things. Um, the, um, uh, the, the inherent problem is that the assumption that the scatterer above the cloud is, is, is in some way characterized so that you can measure the, the uh, optical thickness through transmittance twice. Um, uh, and, and so that's um, it, uh, sort of on our to-do list. Uh, we'd like to we'd like to find some way of getting independent calibration of of of, of these uh, products. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Ming Wang. Yeah. So uh, I see the value of this form, like uh, processes out of this is quite unique. Uh, this one is good for statistics, say at one particular location. It would be useful if you can check the cloud in uh, like a Lagrangian type of sense. 
example, you uh, see the evolution of the Yeah, well, uh, I mean, you saw the tracking in, in sort of that series of images that I gave you. So we're tracking these. We can, we can see cloud features moving across, depends on which field of view we have. We can see cloud features moving across for the order of a minute. I don't know if that's, that's longer time for you or not, but um, uh, at least that's the kind of a time scale that we, that we think we can reasonably confidently track these things. Uh, you, you see a little feature, it looks like somebody's, the gall's nose, and then you follow that nose as it goes across. And, and so, so that's the kind of thing we've done, but I think you know, some, some kind of neural net uh, feature recognition could really enhance this. But if, if, if the camera can follow the uh, cloud, um, there's, uh, we're not the only people who've ever thought of taking a, a commercial digital camera out to the atmosphere and looking at the real world that way. Um, there are people who are looking at cumulus development. They're looking at it side on at a distance and they're watching this thing develop and evolve and, and taking photographs of that evolution. Uh, it, it's, not, it's a qualitative image and not trying to get out the optical properties. Um, so uh, David Romps uh, at Berkeley is doing that sort of thing. He gives posters to the arm meeting from time to time, um, or his students. Um, there's, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of interest in this, uh, uh, this imaging, so we're not the, the first kids on the block, but we're really focusing on the high resolution to see what we can learn at that scale. And I, did, I had a conversation earlier with Murat, and uh, you know, this is, he's kind of getting to the point in his high resolution models where he's approaching the kind of thing that we can see observationally. And there, there might be uh, some, some value in seeing if, uh, uh, to, to what extent those uh, uh, models, and you can put an observational simulation into the model easily, I'm sure. And then how, how does that, com is, is there comparison with what we see in observations or not? So that might be a direction to go that would then inform some of the understanding that ultimately has to be represented in larger scale models. But just, just to, to, you know, um, I'm just sort of astonished that clouds of, of this sort of, I mean, the optical depth of one, uh, 24 hour average shortwave cloud radiative effect is 50, 50 watts per square meter, that's huge. And this is totally uncharacterized area uh, in observations. Just a quick question about cloud physics. <coughs> is, it, is it sort of a thick, a low density cloud that has the same optical depth as a thin, high density cloud? Does it have the same effect on scattering? To first order, yeah, it would. In, this, in a short wave, you don't, you don't really care what that vertical distribution is. The optical. Uh, thickness, optical depth is, is sort of your your coin of the realm. So it's considered a high quality parameter or not parameter? It's a real desideratum, if you wish, uh, uh, in terms of, of the measurement community. And the, 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 I referred earlier to that paper by Turner and others in 07, where they're in some ways greatly lamenting the ability to characterize these clouds of, of low optical depth. And, and thank you for being such a receptive audience. Don't forget we have lunch in the next room. Yeah, if, if, if there are students who want to meet after lunch, I'll be happy. Oh, that's